Welcome back to Cinema Flex Music Picks. I'm Davey, your host with the most, the beast with the least. At least we can do it today. It's a nice Sunday edition of Jimmy Stewart, so it's a wonderful month. So we're going to be looking at Rear Window today from from this behemoth, the uh, Hitchcock Masterpieces Collection, which as you can see is missing one. So I'll put this down. And the one that's missing is Rear Window. Mm. So Rear Window is the film we're going to be looking at today. There you go, there's a little postcard of it, which uh, recreates the original film poster in technical. But if you excuse me, I'm a little bit busy. At the moment, you see there's um, another light's quite bright, but I need to keep up on the neighbours or something going on over there. Don't like that at all. Yeah. Ironside over there. Perry Mason, I think he's up to something. But uh, anyway, we'll crack on. This is the second film from the Stuart and Hitch collaborations that we've looked at. We did Rope in the first week. Um, and for a long time, I thought this was a little bit overrated, but looking at it a bit more critically, I've come to really appreciate it um, in my last five or six views, um, and, and looking at it from a message point of view, and not just from a purely entertainment point of view. Um, I think there's a lot going on that, that is under the surface, and is about Hitchcock's own obsessions and the filmmaker's own obsessions with uh, the camera and the lens and how he needs to view the world. Um, so Rear Window um, came out in summer of 54, so a lot of 50s movies this month, um, but um, essentially the plot is that Jimmy Stewart is his photographer all over the world, he's um, restless, he recently broken his leg and it's confined him to his apartment, his really nice apartment in New York. So he must be a very highly paid photographer. He's got a girlfriend, played by Grace Kelly, um, who he is happy to be in a relationship with, but doesn't want it settled down. He says, look, I'm going to be going all over the world, Brazilian rainforest, war zones, and you ain't going, you're a socialite, you're not set for that. And she says, well, you know, you're not a spring chicken, maybe it's time that you'd met me halfway and we, you know, I can't wait around forever, you know, kind of thing. Um, so there's, there's that kind of underpinning their relationship. And there's also the wonderful Thelma Ritter, who is Jimmy's kind of um, physio, I guess. You know, she's she's coming in every day to look after him and give him a massage and make sure his, his needs are attended to and things. But Jimmy, being a photographer, um, is obsessed with that, with the outside world. And he sits and just views that as his television or his music. Um, one interesting thing about this film, apart from the opening score and the closing score, there's no actual music apart from what you hear in the film that the characters themselves would hear. You know, so the neighbours, for example, one of them's a composer and you hear his music. So it's all um, diegetic, diegetic is I think the term for that, where everything, all the sound effects and all this, the music that you hear is in character, um, what they were hearing as well. So. There's no traditional score, there's no dun dun dun, you know. Um, so it's all very much realistic, it's not the right word because it's heightened, but it's um, it's it's um, full documentarian in that regard, um, where Hitchcock wants you to, to be able to kind of identify with a real world scenario if, if a bit heightened. Um, the film is like a Wes Anderson wet dream because the real star of the film is not Jimmy Stewart, it's not Grace Kelly, it's not even my beloved Thelma Ritter, it's the sets. It was all filmed in the studio but they painstakingly recreated, it was a guy called Ferreira I believe, 
um, recreated a city block from behind. So you see like you see a bit of the street, but you're seeing like the back of the the city block, um, where Jeff's apartment looks onto their back, and you know he's at the back of his apartment. So when he looks out his window, he sees a perfectly flat view of everybody's little lives, exactly like the start of a Wes Anderson movie. It's almost like a little dollhouse. Um, and he has little stories for them all. He has um, little names for them. There's Miss Lonely Hearts. There's um, the young couple that have just got married. There's... Um, so her name Miss Aerobics or something, the one who always does a rather raunchy uh, uh, keep fit stuff. Um, and uh, there's the composer, you know, so every, he's got a handle on who the neighbours are. But very early on, Thelma Ritter says to him, you know, one, one of the major problems in the world is that too many people are too busy looking out instead of getting out and looking back in. So essentially take a look at yourself and that's kind of the message of the film kind of at points until it really isn't because it, the film challenges you to say voyeurism which we don't need to go into that whole thing voyeurism in this film have been written about ad nauseum um is voyeurism a good or a bad thing both is the answer so voyeurism for its own sake just to be nosy as they start out, just to be um, almost perverted in a way because, you know, Jeff has a good long look at Miss Aerobics. Excuse me. Some, some definitely going on out there. Um, so Jeff has a good long look around so you know he is, on certain people he holds his gaze the male gaze a little bit too long and you can kind of read it as Hitchcock as director making a commentary on the storyteller's role does the director is he too morbid is he too salacious does he hold the camera on the horrible things too long for a reaction? Is he more interested in the the, the gruesome, you know? Um, is is he partially responsible if he doesn't take any action to to not um, control events rather than just observe them? That kind of thing. So there's a lot of discussion in that uh, in here about that, where. Um, Jeff's very, Jeff is Jimmy Stewart's character, is very withdrawn and he witnesses what he believes is the murder of a woman across the road by uh, Raymond Burr's character, who's very heavily made up um, to look older, apparently because um, um, Hitchcock wanted him to look more like David O. Selznick, who Hitchcock did not like, did not get on with. Um, so, the idea is that Jimmy's nosiness is what's keeping him away from Grace Kelly because he can't appreciate what he's actually got. She wants to get married, she wants, you know, it's Grace Kelly for God's sake. But he's more interested in spying on his neighbours. Um, then, he does witness something that could be something rather sinister. This is a Hitchcock movie, so that's going to happen. Um, and the question then is, is he right to just let things play out and see what happens and get more proof, if you will? Or is it best to jump the gun and try and preempt things? Um, will he be called a cook? Well, that does happen. He's got a friend in the police force and um, he's not believed because he's again he's jumped the gun he's he's phoned too soon um, before there's any real evidence against uh, I always want to say Ironside against Raymond Burr um, Perry Mason um, and he has put I'm not going to go into spoilers because if you ain't seen Rear Window you really need to but he puts Grace Kelly in a precarious situation 
And as I said, Thelma Ritter has that line where she says, that's the problem with the world, there's too many people, you know, not going out and looking in, taking a look at themselves. But Thelma Ritter is an, aud an audience surrogate. So we begin by judging Jeff for ignoring Grace Kelly and for being a voyeur. But we, just like Thelma Ritter, are guilty too because as Jeff finds more compelling evidence and tells her about it, all very uh, insubstantial evidence, but kinda compelling, and you know it's a movie so you're even more compelled, it's a Hitchcock movie so you're even more compelled, Thelma Ritter starts to believe more and more. So she goes from, oh this is, you know, stop being so nosy, to really quite excited by it. She's getting into the gory details. Look at me scrubbing the walls because the blood must have went everywhere. Yeah. And we two are along for the ride. We're imagining, oh, what's, what's that dog digging up? Is it bones? You know, we want to see what it is. Is it, oh, I hope it's the bloody knife. Yeah. So we're, we're willing a woman's death we don't know that, that uh, Raymond Burr has killed his wife. We'll find out if he has or hasn't. And if Jimmy Stewart and co are right to have their suspicions. But we don't know it. For the majority of the movie, everything could be circumstantial. Absolutely everything. That's what his police friend says. You've added two and two and two and two and got 48. You know. Reasonable doubt that would be torn to shreds in any court. There's nothing here. We wouldn't even talk to the guy, never mind arrest him and caution him and try and make a case based on what you've got. So we are the guilty party. We become like Thelma Ritter, too engaged in the conspiracy to believe that this woman is dead, that the Raymond Burr's killed his wife. Like Grace Kelly, we go from saying why don't you just appreciate what you've already got to, oh, I hope it is a murder. So we're guilty. We are the voyeurs along with Hitchcock. The filmmaker as voyeur and the film goer as voyeur are really the themes of this film and whether or not it's justified. Um, and again, I'm not going to spoil the Raymond Barr storyline because, again, if you haven't seen it. But I think I can at least say that there's even an ambiguous ending, not, n not with regards to that, but with regards to the relationship of uh, Jeff and, and Grace Kelly, where um, we see them sitting silently and uh, he's starting to doze off. She's reading a book about the Himalayas or some sort. So you think, oh, so she has accepted that she'll need to go all around the world. But then as he dozes off, she pulls out a copy of Vogue or Cosmo or something. So you think, oh, is that relationship ever going to actually work? Because the minute he fell asleep, she's back to being the socialized city girl again. So there's even that kind of mm, ambiguity over whether they are meant to be together or yeah, whether or not they're kind of bad for each other, which is um, quite interesting, separate from the the whole murder, potential murder um, storyline. But it's a, in general a wonderful film, wonderful paced, wonderful build. Jimmy, and um, we'll always try and bring this back to what Jimmy's role in it is, is uh, Hitchcock essentially. He's the one, the, the filmmaker, he's the one with the lens who's telling the story and trying to compel you into coming along with them. So just as Hitchcock does with his great thrillers and his murder mysteries or his man on the run movies you know the innocent man done wrong kind of movies um or would go on to do with psycho and you know the birds he is trying to tell us a compelling story to pull us in just as jeff is trying to come up with a compelling story to make grace kelly um, and thelma ritter compelled to join in his flights of fancy so it's it's really quite a remarkable film and um and being able to read it as as a, an early example of of um a real a tourist kind of thing 
where and I know Hitchcock you know rejected these you know they were all just entertainment for him but very early on Truffaut and Film de Cahiers were writing about Cinema de Cahiers excuse me were writing about the, the auteur theory and whatnot and how the filmmaker if he's a true filmmaker can't stop himself from expressing these themes they'll just come out because that's his art um, and, and Hitchcock does return to that over and over where we are sometimes against our will guilty parties in wanting to see bad things happen um, for our own excitement and amusement so we want to see a dead body in this we wouldn't be satisfied if the wife just turned up again or if it turned out the wife was out of state you know visiting relatives or at a hospital or something we want a murder because that's what we want in an exciting adventure you know even though it all takes place through Je Jeff's eyes in his apartment everything we see absolutely everything a bit like rope um, but the set is so massive, it was the biggest indoor set at the time, um, the set is so massive that it doesn't feel contained, it feels expansive, and we see Jeff watching Grace Kelly out there in the apartments across the way, I mean, they, built, they essentially built apartments for this film, it's amazing. Um, so we watch through Jeff's binoculars and through the lens as things change, we see what's happening in the other apartments and things so it feels like a much bigger world than what we actually when you think about it after um have experienced we've not left the bloody apartment once it's actually less expansive than rope because we've not left the room at least in rope we were in the kitchen at certain times you know so this is less expansive but a much bigger film with it it's quite a remarkable achievement um, and just like most Hitchcocks, from a storytelling point of view, from an acting point of view, from a director's point of view, from everybody in the technical side, from a thematic point of view, it's just near perfect. I mean, we're talking about a, a master at the peak of his game, and we're talking about two absolute icons. I don't think Grace Kelly was a great actress, but she was a great presence, um, which is essential here because you want to ask yourself you've got grace bloody kelly for goodness sake why are you not interested you know why is grace kelly's in our lingerie behind him jeff sitting here trying to look at raymond burr you know whoever floats your boat you know if, if he just tuned into bbc every day he'd watch ironside repeats but anyway um that's my that's my hit me's worth on uh, on rear window um, I've been kind of pitting off the Hitchcocks a little bit because there's so so much written about them. I'm dreading having to cover Vertigo because what what can you possibly say about Vertigo that's not been written about? I mean, there's there's not just thousands of essays and things. There's thousands of books alone on Vertigo. But um, same as it's a wonderful life. I'm kind of I'm working on a way to try and find a theory on it that I can, you know that's what I've tried to do all month is come up with my own take. So we'll see we'll see. We'll see what I can come up with. But if you excuse me, I need to return because that bastard over there is definitely up to something. Anyway, be very careful out there. I'm going to be very careful in here because I hurt my leg last night. But if you go out there and, you know, just be careful of that guy over there or whoever your neighbours are. And that's also kind of the theme of the film. Be neighbourly. Don't just have neighbours. Know your neighbours. Except for that guy over there. He's a bastard. Love and mercy, my dears. Love and mercy. Go on. Off with you.